Hello, my name is Dr. Yoshihiro Katsura, and I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon practicing in Northern California. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some post-op restrictions and instructions that I have for my patients. I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about the recovery process. One important thing to know is that every patient is going to recover with a different level of pain and speed. Some people will have a fast recovery, some people will have a slow recovery, some people will have more pain, some people will have less pain. A lot of it depends on the type of surgery you're having, but also on your own personality. It's important to note that spine surgery can be painful. In some cases, the pain can be very severe. It all depends on the type of surgery that you're having. It's important to have realistic expectations of your recovery. That includes things like understanding how much pain you may have, how your function may be limited by that pain, and how ultimately that will affect your lifestyle once you get home. Having realistic expectations will decrease your overall anxiety and stress, and understanding that it does take time to recover. After surgery, you may have some functional limitations, meaning simple daily tasks may be more difficult for you, such as getting out of bed, getting up and going to the bathroom, cooking meals for yourself. It's important to reach out to friends and family and have them available to help you complete these general tasks. I find that a lot of patients have questions about pain management after surgery, and so I want to go through the different types of strategies that we have to help you manage your post-operative pain. In the modern era of spine surgery, we have a lot of different agents that we can use to help combat pain. The most basic include numbing medications. Those are medicines that the surgeon will inject directly into the wound and around the wound to dull the nerve ending so that you don't actually have transmission of pain. After that, we use IV narcotics. Those are the opioid medications that are injected through your IV, such as morphine and Dilaudid that are very fast acting and are very useful for severe pain. We typically use a combination of IV narcotics and oral narcotics. After surgery, oral narcotics include things like oxycodone, hydrocodone, and tramadol. These medicines are very useful for acute pain, but do have lots of side effects. In addition to the narcotic medicines, we have the adjunctive pain medicines. These are things like gabapentin, muscle relaxants like Flexerol, Tylenol and steroids. These are used in combination to augment the power of other pain medicines you may be taking and if used in concert are actually quite effective at reducing your surgical pain. So for the first three days after surgery, we typically use all of these agents. The numbing medications will wear off in about 12 to 24 hours and then you may have a little bit of increased pain after that and we will manage that with IV narcotics and oral narcotics plus the adjunctive pain medicines. On days 3 to 10, we really want you to get off of the IV narcotics and transition just to oral narcotics and we still use the other oral agents such as gabapentin, muscle relaxants, Tylenol. And then from days 10 to 20 or around then, we really want you to be off of your narcotics totally and hopefully your pain is uh, able to be controlled with just oral agents like gabapentin, Tylenol, muscle relaxants. I do not use anti-inflammatory medications after surgery because they can increase the risk of bleeding. I want to talk a little bit now about activities after spine surgery and what you can expect. I encourage all my patients to walk. Walking is the prototypical spine exercise. It does not put a lot of stress on the back, and so it's a good way to get exercise after you've had your procedure. Uh, I do not put any limitations on how much you walk. I think you can just use common sense. If it starts to cause pain, then take a break. At baseline, I recommend at least 10 minutes in the a.m. and then another 10-minute walk in the p.m. You'll start walking with the physical therapist in the hospital, and you can also do some light exercises in your hospital bed. These include things like ankle pumps, quad contractions, and nerve glides, which I'll explain in a following slide. Please ask your surgeon before starting more rigorous exercises or activities, as you will have restrictions. The easiest way to remember the restrictions is with an acronym called NOBLT, which does not stand for bacon, lettuce, and tomato, but instead bending, lifting, and twisting. So no bending, lifting, twisting. Sleeping, you can sleep on your back with a pillow under your head, supporting your neck, and a pillow under your knees. This will take the pressure off your lumbar spine. If you're more comfortable on your side, it's fine to sleep, but make sure your head is in line with your body, and that you put a pillow between your knees. You generally should not start driving until you've received clearance from your surgeon, but it is okay to be a passenger in cars. 
I tell my patients to take trips no longer than 40 minutes, and if they are planning to drive longer than 40 minutes, to take a break and plan their stops. Let's look at some exercises that you can do in your hospital bed. The first exercise is called an ankle pump, which basically just moving your feet up and down helps circulate the blood in the calves. The next exercise is called a nerve glide, which consists of sliding your heel up and down in bed, maintaining contact between your heel and the bed, and this helps move the sciatic nerve and prevent it from getting scarred after your surgery. Quad contractions just consist of contracting your quadriceps muscles, and that's a good way to maintain the strength of your legs without having to bear any weight and also help circulate blood. Let's revisit the universal spinal precautions because they're really important to know and protect yourself after your spine surgery. It, again, it is no BLT, no bending, lifting, or twisting. So bending is pretty easy. You just don't want to bend through your back or through your neck after spine surgery. Lifting obviously puts strain on the spine and on the neck, and so you don't want to lift anything really heavier than 5 or 10 pounds or heavier than a quart of milk. You don't want to twist through the spine or put any unnecessary strain through the surgical site. One of the challenges of maintaining your spinal precautions is when you get in and out of bed, and so there's a special technique called a log roll that you can learn to help maintain your spinal precautions as you get in and out of your bed. When you do a log roll, the first thing you do is pull your knees up towards your chest, then you hug yourself, and that puts you in a good position to roll onto your side, and then you can use your arm to basically push yourself into an upright position as you swing your legs off the bed. It takes a couple of times to practice it, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty easy. Using the log roll will keep your spine in a neutral position, and you can just reverse the process if you want to use it to get back into bed. Bracing is another area that patients often have questions about. I use several different braces in my practice. For cervical spine surgeries, I will use a hard cervical brace, which is an aspen collar, which is a rigid orthosis. I use that mainly for cervical fusions, and I usually have patients keep it on for at least 6 to 12 weeks, depending on the type of fusion that they've had. I use a soft cervical brace, which is one of those foam braces that you might have seen on TV for certain procedures, uh, such as the laminoplasty and laminectomy. And these braces don't really provide structural support, but they do remind you not to move your neck too much and to keep your neck in a good posture, and I typically have patients wear it for about six weeks. Uh, it's okay to remove your cervical brace for meals because you don't want to get it dirty, and also for bathing. Uh, for lumbar spine, I'll have my patients wear a lumbosacral orthosis, or otherwise known as an LSO, uh, or otherwise known as a low back brace. I use these for all my lumbar surgeries. For lumbar fusions, patients typically will wear it for six to 12 weeks, depending on the type of fusion that they've had. And for lumbar decompressions, patients will generally wear it for six weeks. I mainly have patients use it when they're upright or walking around, and it is okay to remove it for bathing and sleeping. Probably the most confusing area for patients is how to take care of their surgical wounds, so I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Surgical wound care starts when the wound is closed. I use dissolvable sutures on almost all of my spine cases, and these are placed underneath the skin and you'll never see them. Once the wound is sutured shut, I use a sealing glue known as Dermabond to actually physically seal the wound shut. And then on top of that, I'll place small strips that are called steri strips, and those help take the tension off of the repair. Steri strips are meant to be left on, and over time they will fall off on their own. Once all of that has been applied to your wound, I place a waterproof dressing over the entire wound. And if this is on your lumbar spine or on the back of your neck, you may be sitting on a chair or in bed and can, you could easily roll this dressing off. And so I'll place a clear plastic adhesive dressing over the entire thing just to keep it intact. And that adds as another layer of waterproofing. You may have a drain site, uh, which is a small plastic tube that goes into the surgical bed that just helps get some of the fluid out of there after your surgery and reduce some of the swelling. And that's removed before you leave the hospital. You will only go home with that if I give you specific instructions to do so. So the primary and secondary dressing I typically instruct my patients to leave it on for at least seven days. Sometimes smaller surgeries, I'll let you take it off in about five days. 
you basically don't want to touch your dressing unless given instructions to. The, the dressing is sterile and um, you want to keep it that way. If you do a lot of dressing changes, you can introduce bacteria before the wound is sealed. And your wound should be mostly sealed by seven days after surgery. After the seven days is passed, you can take off the primary and secondary dressing. It can be quite sticky and can be difficult. It's useful to have a family member do so. And it's very important that you keep your hands clean while you do that. So wash them and sterilize them before doing so. And you'll uncover the wound and the steri strips. And generally you leave the steri strips in place. And once you have removed the primary and secondary dressings, it's okay to shower. Just don't let the wound get too wet and then pat dry after you're done with your shower. Uh, do not scrub, do not apply any lotions to your wound and one really important thing is to not submerge your wound specifically in any contaminated water such as bath water, lake water, ocean water, pond water, rivers, etc. Once your wound is mature and you have clearance from your surgeon you can submerge it. Let's review the important bullet points of taking care of your post-operative wound. Number one, you remove your dressing typically after seven days. Sometimes I'll give you instructions to remove it earlier, but please check with me. Anytime you go to touch your dressing or wound, you must wash your hands with soap and hand sanitizer. You don't want to introduce any bacteria into the surgical area. Once the dressing is removed, you may shower normally. If the wound is dry, you can leave it open to air, or you can cover it with a new sterile dressing depending on your comfort. Do not submerge, pick at, remove the stair strips from the wound. The stair strips will fall off on their own. Please give us a call if there's any persistent drainage or redness, and in general, just use common sense and keep the wound clean. Patients often wonder what they should call the office about. I think it's important to know that there is expected pain in the surgical site, and over time that will improve, and that's part of the normal healing process. However, if you start to notice new numbness or weakness, that should definitely be reported to the office and your surgeon. If your pain is extreme, that should also be reported to your doctor. If you have any signs of infection, such as fevers, chills, redness, drainage from the incision, that should also be reported imme immediately. Any new nausea or headaches should be reported as well. If you have any sudden shortness of breath, chest pain, or difficulty with breathing, you should just call 911. Thank you for watching this video. I'm looking forward to you having a successful recovery.